All right, thank you for those who are on. I'm going to give a few more minutes to let a few additional people join and we will get started. We will get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Megan Smith. I am the AAA Wellness Manager. And a little bit about my background. I went to Boise State, have my degree in kinesiology for health promotion and exercise science, and I'm a certified nutritionist. So nutrition is something I am very passionate about. And if you've listened to a nutrition presentation or worked with me before, um, you obviously know there is a lot to cover. So um, we broke this down into a two-part series. So today we're going to cover uh, part of the topics, and then we'll have another presentation in April to go over some additional things that we find very important with nutrition. And I will reference quite a bit the nutrition on the go presentation. And I have a few reoccurring slides, but then also at the end of this presentation, I put some of the slides that I felt were really important. So, um, cause as you probably know, nutrition is very complex. So there's a lot of parts to it. So it's very easy to go off on tangents in different directions. So if you come across something that you want to learn more about, you know, write it down. I'm happy to work with you one on one on answering any questions about it. But I just don't want to make this presentation too repetitive of uh, the nutrition on the go. So this one is focused a lot more on nutritional weight loss. And here are the discussion items I'm going to go over today. So we will be talking a little bit about a diet, what that means, what it looks like, um, and just kind of talking about a little preconceived notions that are around dieting, um, and then behavioral change that goes into making these, you know, successful lifestyle changes, thinking about, am I hungry? Um, and often, and then foods that you, we should be kind of saying no to or avoiding, and then, you know, going over lots of yes foods, things to be doing um, for nutritional weight loss. And then I want to talk with you about setting a goal today, and we'll have a Q&A session. So I do have the chat open, um, so you're welcome to send over a chat at any time, and I'll address that, you know, just so we don't get 
if we get too far off that topic. So feel free to chat over anything or you could shoot in the Q&A box if you want to keep it private. You're welcome to do that and I'll cover those at the end. All right. So let's get started. So first we're going to talk about behavioral change. And or sorry, a diet. So when you think about diet, there's a few different ways this can go. Um, sometimes it's referred to as I am on a diet and you instantly think of, okay, like Atkins diet or beach body where you're sticking to something and that typically has an end date. But when I use the word diet, I want you to really think about the kinds of foods that a person, animal, or community is habitually eating. So, you know, this word can be very skewed and there's two definitions of it right there. So the, your diet can be the what makes up your diet, what you regularly are eating. But then also a diet can mean a special course of food, which one really restricts oneself either to lose weight or for medical reasons. So I don't want you to think so much about the second one where it's a very restrictive and, you know, yes, we will talk more about things to focus on and things to avoid, but we, you know, typically that second one has an end date. You know, it's the best and the fastest approach to losing weight. And yes, fat diets can work, but they are typically not sustainable. They might work short term. You know, we've all heard Atkins, South Beach, grapefruit, three-day diet, you know, to name a few, um, keto, you know, these types of things. Some can be very sustainable, or you might learn parts of the diet that's sustainable, but a lot of them aren't and they have end dates. So typically when that end date hits, we end up slowly going back to old eating behaviors and gain back weight. Um, so when we're thinking about diets, you know, I will say there are a few diets that I recommend, you know, other medical professionals highly recommend because I look at them more as eating plans. They are a way of eating lifestyle changes, you know, and they're not very re extremely restrictive in the way like things like Atkins might be. So three that I will touch on real quick. And if you're interested in talking more or looking into these further, um, you're welcome to reach out to me, but Mediterranean diet. So this is, you know, where people in Mediterranean part of our nation really eat lots of plant-based foods, whole grains, vegetable, vegetables, and legumes, fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices are the foundation of the diet. So it really restricts. There's not a lot of red meat. Most mostly is focused on fish and lots of plant-based protein. Um, the DASH diet, which is the dietary approach to stop hypertension. So this really focuses on foods that are rich in potassium, calcium, magnesium, which can help control hypertension, which is your, you know, high blood pressure. So it limits a lot of sodium, saturated fats, added sugars. And then there's the MIND diet, which is a combination of the two above, um, which stands for Mediterranean dash diet intervention for neurodegenerative delay. So it's a combination and it's really helps to target health and of the aging brain and prevent dementia. So those are a few if you're interested in kind of exploring into something that you want to follow more closely. But other than that, you know, we're really just going to be focusing today on a whole foods diet. So looking at a lot of whole foods in which I touch on a lot in my last other nutrition presentations and just really eating foods in their closest form of, you know, how they are from this, how they are grown, how they are produced. So thinking about it as a lifestyle journey. So not focusing on that diet that I'm going to try this diet. And, you know, once it's up, I might slowly go back to other things. So this is a lifestyle. These are changes that you're hopefully making to sustain and to stick to throughout your life. Um, because it is just like anything, just like being active, just like managing stress. You know, it isn't something that we do time, we want to do time to time. And then we have that end goal and we meet it and then we give up. So it really is about making sure this is your journey. This is your new lifestyle. 
and sustainability is key. So I always ask people when I'm working with them and they tell me something they want to do or they tell me goals they have for themselves, I ask, is that is that sustainable? When somebody says, I'm going to cut out sugar completely, you know, it might be great for a short detox, but when I say, is that sustainable? Is that something you're going to be able to do forever? And then it's like, oh, maybe not, but moderation, thinking more about that moderation and limiting and retraining your brain to allow necessary amounts of these different types of nutrients is kind of what we're going to more focus on. Uh, And then thinking a lot about what to add. A lot of times with the diets, you think about everything restrict. So I like with the eating plans I discussed, you're focusing on the foods to be adding in and then limiting or moderation of certain foods. And then just always keep it in mind, you know, nutrition is a big part of weight loss. You know, some studies show that 90% of weight loss is from nutrition, but then those other factors that weigh in are the physical activity, you know, making sure you're as active often and, you know, and trying to shoot for about 150 minutes of physical activity each week. Um, Stress reduction is a big one, healthy sleep habits, hormonal regulation, and self-care and positive mindsets. So just some other factors to focus on as well. So behavior change. This is a big one when you're thinking about your nutrition. A lot of times things are you know, things we'll do with habits around our food can be stuff that's ingrained from when we were a child, you know, the way our family ate, you know, back then if food was limited, you were finishing your plate, serving sizes were much more in proportion to what we really need. Um, Sugar and size of beverages and treats was much smaller. So things have adapted and adjusted over the years, but our mindsets stay the same with food. Um, But with any behavior change, you know, it really starts with accepting where you're at today and then finding that reason or that why, which is your intrinsic motivation on why you want to make that change. So why do you want to lose this weight? Why do you want to be healthier? And then thinking about that process goal that is really identity based. So an example of that is I want to become a healthy, active and energized person who can confidently participate in any activity that appeals to me. Or it can be, you know, I want to become healthier. So once I retire, I'm able to go do things that I want to be doing, or I want to be healthy so I can play with my kids and keep up with them. And, you know, so it's really kind of that identity-based why, the reason that you are doing this versus those in-state or those outcome goals. So I hear them all the time. I want to lose 50 pounds. I want to lose 10 pounds. And it's a number. But a lot of times once that in-state is met, we go back to the old behaviors or the goal just kind of disappears. So you can have that in-state goal as long as you kind of make it into then a process goal of, I want to lose 40 pounds and maintain that weight loss by doing X, Y, Z. So sometimes a lot of it really has to do with the way you coin it in your in your brain and focus on it and think about it. Um, And it all begins with positive changes. So thinking about the changes that might seem easiest and most doable at first. And I'm a big advocate of just focusing on one thing at a time. Because a lot of times when we want to start these types of journeys, we get super excited and we try to change everything at once. And then it all just kind of can blow up in our faces and we don't end up making any changes that have been sustainable. So thinking about small changes, and I have a presentation on our website on goal setting, where we talk a lot about floor goals and tiny doable goals that you can do every day, like making sure I get my water in. So even if I don't have the greatest day nutritional wise, at least I still drink my water, or at least I'm still getting my eight hours of sleep. So trying those small changes and then be all in on the changes you decide to make. So practice makes progress. The more we practice, the more repetition we have around these types of habits, it builds our confidence. We see that it's working. We see that it's doable and we can do it. So continue to practice, practice, practice on a daily basis, whatever you might be focused on. And then remembering if you miss a day, it's okay. 
being resilient and jumping right back onto your routine is the most important thing you can do and believe in yourself. So reflect on your habits, you know, the good and the bad, except where you're at today, start to replace some of those unhealthier habits with healthier ones, which we'll talk a lot about today, and then really reinforce those new habits of healthier eating. So I love this little um, gif on the side here that practice makes progress brings understanding of what works and what doesn't work. You know, ups your skill level, your skill sets to create new habits, which builds confidence. So thinking about this whole process, it is a process. It is not going to happen overnight. It is going to happen for the rest of your life. And continuing to have that focus on it is so important. All right, so right into the nutrition now. A big part, you know, I talk a lot about in my other presentations, calories in, calories out. You know, we all have heard that talk that when you think about weight loss, you know, we really have to make sure we are eating the right amount of calories for our bodies, for our what we are doing on a daily basis, and for our age, for our sex, for our life styles, you know, all of these things. There's a big range. Um, and really thinking about how that breakdown of macronutrients is important, which I have some resources on later in the presentation, but it all starts down with that mindfulness around food or intuitive eating. You might have heard it called that and asking yourself, am I hungry? Because so much of our eating can be emotional, can be non-mindful. And so really thinking about before you eat and listening to your body's signals, tune into those hunger levels. So if you've ever done the Wonder Health presentation, they talk about four levels of hunger or the Wonder Health program. Um, they have the four levels of hunger and they really don't tell you to eat until level three or at level two, maybe you have a snack to hold you over. So really knowing about your hunger cues and understanding what your cues look like personally, because those are different from person to person. And then also pausing during your meal to think about how it tastes and feel and how full you are, you know, really slowing down and chewing each bite. That's a lot about the mindfulness and then stopping when you are comfortably full, giving yourself body time for the stomach signal to get to your brain and let you know, I am full. I am satisfied, which might mean leaving food on your plate, saying no to dessert, you know, things like that. So knowing your personal hunger cues is very important. These can be things like your stomach growling, a low drop in energy, you know, noticing your blood sugar change, a little shakiness, headache, problems focusing, you know, a big a common one is irritability. So people might say, okay, I'm getting hangry. And then also understanding that there are certain things that might set off your hunger cues or they might not be working correctly. So hormonal changes, a chronic illness, certain medications, they may cure, curb your hunger. So working closely with somebody, if you notice these things that your hunger cues aren't, you know, working, have you think are correct. So to focus on that intuitive eating. Other reasons, you know, we tend to eat or binge, you know, this is kind of that emotional eating, stress, major life events, craving a specific food or type, you know, that might be more emotional eating. Um, some people, when they're going through stressful events, they binge, they want sugar, they you know, might just eat their emotions, but others might not eat at all. And it's completely different where they skip meals and they're malnourished and they might have rapid weight loss, which isn't healthy either. So really making sure you're um, recognizing when it is emotional eating that you might be tired. A lot of times at night, those late night snacks is that your body really needs rest because we get fuel from resting as well. So if you think, if you're noticing you're snacking at night, sometimes it's just that you need to go to bed. And same with thirst. If we're dehydrated, we can get similar, similar signals that are hunger. So sometimes it's just making sure you're properly hydrated. And then also habitual type things or addictions. You know, sometimes it's very habitual. Like, okay, when I go to a movie, I have to have popcorn and a soda because that's what you do. Or the addictions, like every day at two o'clock, I go get my Starbucks because now you probably have created an addiction to that artificial energy and that caffeine um, from the caffeine or that sugar splurge. So recognizing those types of things too. 
um, social situations. A lot of times if you're around food and, you know, you might not even be hungry, but if there's a cheese plate out, you just sit and notice yourself eating and then also boredom. So always asking yourself that question before any food inserts your mouth of, am I hungry? And then I do want to talk about some foods that fight stress. Um, real quick, here is a list of good foods to keep around when you are stressed out, which you know we all deal with stress. Some stress, you stress can be very healthy and help us perform at a healthy, you know, better levels. But that long-term stress that sticks around forever, which is chronic stress, you know, those are the ones when we really want to fight and make sure we are not reaching for the stressed foods that we want, which are the high fat, high sugar, you know, baked goods, carbs, those types of things. So here are foods and their nutrients that really help fight those stress hormones, help level out, help anti-inflammatory type effects in your body. So I won't go through them all, but um, you can see them. Great things to keep around, keep in your office, um, a glass of chamomile tea, green tea, nuts in the car is a good one, having a daily dose of eggs, um, fatty fish, those types of things. All right. So next we're going to talk about things to say no to. And I always add most of the time because I don't want it to ever feel like you are completely restricted. There are a few foods that I would probably say if you can at all cause avoid them forever. And those are things like hot dogs and really highly processed packaged meats, stuff that just is extremely highly processed. But there might be times to times where you do eat them and it's not the end of the world, but it is saying no to them most of the time. So I decided today we'll go over the no's first and then we're going to dive into all the things you should be eating, what we want you to focus on. So for the no's and the buzz kills. The biggest one of all is the empty calories, things with minimal nutritional value. So looking at the label, which in April, we are really going to jump into reading nutrition labels, what to look for, what all those numbers mean, um, but really anything highly processed. So it's highly modified form of its whole food has a really long nutrition label. So when it lists the ingredients, it's, you know, goes on and on and on and on. And it has a long shelf life. So when you look at something like a packaged muffin that can last for five months, that is what we want to stay away from. Because no muffin that you make at home with you know, whole ingredients is going to last for five months. So when things have so much additives to give them shelf life, those are the highly, highly processed foods, which are very foreign to our stomach. We don't know how to break down. They come in and it's almost like they then have that shelf life in our gut, which kind of are, it sends off these signals of this isn't nutrients, but it's not breaking down properly. So lots of reasons just to stay away from these highly processed foods, pa packaged foods, you know, and then things that are like juice or fruit snacks versus having an actual piece of whole fruit so much better. And then making treats, treats again, and, and understanding, and it might take a lot of really mindfulness around this, but the dessert doesn't need to be a daily thing. And it's hard because sometimes as kids, we're trained that, oh, you get dessert after dinner. So into our brains, you know, kids are burning so much more fuels, but even they get to a point where if they're getting way too much sugar, we really have to be careful of that with our, um, you know, the younger age with our obesity epidemic. So really making treats be treats again whether it's once a week, whether it's at birthdays, whether it's, you know, celebrating type things, but it is not a daily treat. Yeah. So this is one of my top things I will talk to people on when they want to lose weight or maintain weight loss. And I say, get off the sofas. So when you hear the word sofas, it is referring to solid fats, and added sugars. So two things in a diet that typically will 
you know, really wreak havoc, really make it hard to maintain or to lose weight. And a lot of times when I have people really focus on their added sugars and their saturated fats and really lower those amounts they're getting, they will see weight loss. And there's, you know, clinical reasons why, and I'll go into a little bit of what your body does with these types of nutrients and how it directly goes to our energy and our storage of fat. So, but they are the two nutrients that contribute more to weight gain than any other source of calories. So our solid fats and our added sugars. And, you know, unfortunately, not surprised, but United States foods and the way our nation creates foods and what's marketed and packaged, it has high proportions of these types of nutrients. Um, They're very energy dense, so high in calories, which means lots of empty calories. And the more sofas we eat, the harder it is to budget for those calories that do have our essential nutrients. So then, you know, if the average American they're seeing is eating 800 plus calories per day from just sofas in general, but then we don't have room for the additional calories where we actually need our nutrients. So we're very malnourished, even we're eating plenty of calories. Um, you know, it lacks any minerals or has minerals, vitamins, fibers, you know, so really is there's not the right amount of nutrients from it. So on a daily value, we should be getting about five to 10% of our calories from these solid fats and added sugars. Um, but more we're getting, you know, closer to like 50 to 60%. So to dive into the solid fats a little bit more. So this is fatty animal-based foods, Um, So a solid fat is anything that at room temperature, it is a solid. So red meats, poultry skin, bacon, sausage, deli meats, butter, margarine, coconut oil, other, you know, whole fat dairy products, cheese, whole fat milk, that type of thing. Um, And it's also used in foods with vegetable oil, you know, such as fried food, cookies, donuts, pastries, crackers, those types of things. So solid fats are one that we really need to limit. So when you think about fats, because there's definitely healthy fats, there's four different types of fats. You have your saturated fats, your trans saturated fats, and then we'll get into later the healthier two, which are the monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated. So when you talk about saturated fats, there are room for them in our diet. The American Health Association recommends about five to 6% of total calories per day. So somebody eating about 2000 calories a day, say about 120 calories or 13 grams of saturated fat per day. They used to say 10% of calories, but because America has really gone in a different direction with our epidemic, they have lowered this to five to 6%. So to give you an example, about a cup and a half of ice cream, which is a full fat dairy, has about 12 grams of saturated fat in it. So look, starting to look at these things and understanding the grams of fats and what's recommended. Um, and then the trans-saturated fats. So this is one that, you know, some nations have completely banned trans fats. America is behind the curve on that, or United States. But it is one thing that if you see anything listed as a trans fat on a label, put it back. That is one that I will say absolutely avoid these. This is the worst types of fats. They they recommend less than 1% of calorie or to avoid it at all costs. It really aligns with raising bad cholesterol, lowers the good cholesterol and increased risk for heart disease. Um, So there's really small amounts of naturally occurring trans fats in meats and dairies, but most trans fats are typically added to foods like highly processed packaged foods. So um, that's the place to be looking for it. So here's just a quick graphic on a little bit about those saturated fats and trans fats, and then a little bit about the unsaturated fats that we'll touch on um, later on. So I just love the images so you can see, but not thinking, you know, any animal is saturated fat. So there are definitely healthier kinds. So, but these are just kind of some that you should be staying away from. And then obviously those healthy fats to add in. So then on to sugar. So when you talk about sugar, 
you know, there's, it's hard because there is naturally occurring sugar. So stuff like lactose, fructose, but then there's added sugar. So it's kind of like the fats where there's very many ways it can go and it can be very confusing. And on a label, it can be 15 different names that actually mean sugar. But all I can tell you is remembering that excess sugar stores as fat. So when you think about sugar, and we'll go into later the amounts you should be having, but just to give you kind of a visual about how it works in your body. But your body can only burn so much sugar as fuel, which is glucose. And I like to give the analogy of thinking about like a gas tank. So if you have a car and you go fill up your gas tank, you know, you've been you know, you filled up, it's empty at the beginning of the day. So you fill it up, you're driving all around, you burn gas down. And so you might need to get more gas to fill it back up for more fuel. So same, but if you were to stand there at the pump and overfill that gas tank, you know, what is going to happen? It's going to come running out. It's going to go all over the side of your car and all over the place. So it's excess. So thinking about sugar and fuel, so glucose is the same way. So when we are eating sugar, our pancreas secretes insulin. So the insulin is almost little, little delivery trucks that brings the glucose to the muscles and other cells to use for fuel or energy. But as we keep eating sugar, if we're not burning it, that's where it doesn't have anywhere to go. So it spills out. So this excess sugar, so excess fuel is then stored as glycogen. It can be stored in the muscles, but it's most commonly then stored if there's no room for it left in the muscles on fat cells, which is called adipose or adipocytes, and it's stored for later use. So as these fat cells get the sugar now stored onto them, it's in hopes that later we're going to be burning this energy. But the thing is, with since we consume so much sugar on a daily basis, we're never able to get to that stored sugar. So what happens is these fat cells can only get so big and then new fat cells are created for more sugar to be brought to, to for storage for hopefully later use, but we're never getting to that storage. So our insulin can then also stop working correctly. If it's running out of places, it's not, it's taking it to the muscles, but we have, it's over full on the muscles. So then it's taking it to out into your bloodstream. So it, it really runs into issues of then blood sugar levels, you know, insulin resistance, uh, pre-diabetes, diabetes. So this is how all of those things start to, are started. But so the most important thing we can be doing on a daily basis is limiting our sugar intakes. And I'll talk a little bit more about some other things that convert to sugar, but just being very, very cautious about how much sugar we're eating on a daily basis. So we are actually using those burned fat cells or, you know, those stored fat cells as energy if we're looking to lose weight. So this is where it can be very, very hard to lose weight we are having too much sugar on our diet. So people can restrict calories. They might only be eating, you know, a thousand calories a day, but if there's too much sugar in it, that sugar is still going to be stored as fat. So where people get very frustrated. And then also, you know, another thing that can happen, you know, the liver just really gets overloaded and it can accumulate in the liver, turning into fatty liver disease. So lots of issues come from too much sugar in our diet. Um, and we will talk later on about food labels or next time about food labels and looking at sugar. Um, but here is a, just a image I want you to get in your brain and I want you to forever remember this and start looking at sugar labels on packages. So when you, cause a lot of times it's very hard to see, you know, think about, okay, five grams of this, 10 grams of this, what does that mean? So to give you a visual a packet of sugar or a sugar cube, you know, we've all seen that. That equals one teaspoon or four grams. So when you think about that Pepsi that has, I'm just gonna do a guess, but say 65 grams of sugar, which is probably, oh, actually that is exactly right on. 65 grams of sugar divided by four. So that is 16 and 0.25 sugar cubes. So when you drink a 16 ounce soda, you are eating 16 um, and a quarter sugar cubes. So I like to give that visual in your mind of 
for a glass of water, put in 16 packs of sugar. Like, would you ever drink that? <laughs> Probably no way. You know, it's just going to be too sweet and gross, but we will drink it in a soda. So it is sometimes that our brains have been so acclimated to sugar, it affects the brain in addictive matters, but there is changing this and weaning off of it. But sugar, like I said, is one of those that we really need to work on reducing. So some easy options um, to drink versus the other ones. So Soda, there it is, that 65 grams. Think about 16 and a quarter. Juice, this is why I say eat a piece of fruit versus drinking juice because that has a whopping, you know, over eight packages of sugar in it. And a lot of times it is added. And even though it's naturally occurring, it's fructose, um, eating an orange itself does not have 33 grams of sugar. And also you're getting all the other vital nutrients, like the whole fiber in it, which a lot of things are broken down when it's turned into juice. Um, a green juice, you know, 53 grams of sugar. Store-bought smoothies are one, you know, they're very advertised as health foods, but that one alone almost has 20 grams of sugar in it. And then frappuccinos, those fancy coffee drinks, another place where we get a ton of our sugars. So over 15 packages of sugar in that frappuccino itself. Okay, so big place to start to look at is your beverages and getting sugar out um, of any beverages, really avoiding those sugary beverages. Because a lot of times they don't have nutrients that stick with you and actually fill you up. So that 61 gram of sugar drink might be 400 calories, but is it going to keep you full like a 400 calorie meal did? No. So it's really reevaluating where we're getting our calories from and being very picky about our drinks and our sugars. Um, so this slide I have in my other presentation, I'm just going to kind of skim through it real quick, you know, but it talks about how many calories we're eating per year. But the really thing I want to dive into is the ACA recommends for sugar. So for women, it's about six teaspoons, so no more than 100 calories a day of added sugar. Men, about nine teaspoons. And children, this is a big one, no more than 24 grams per day of sugar. So it is a great time with your kids to really stop thinking about uh, or to stop adding sugar into food, into their diet and making sure it's coming from whole food source and not added sugar. Um, we'll touch more on this next session with the nutrition labels, but a big one is looking at labels. You will now see that it says total, total sugar and then it says added sugar. So the total sugar is going to be those that are naturally occurring. So the lactose, the fructose, those types of things where the added sugar is actually added fructose or not actual sucrose to that, um, whatever food or source of, you know, drink it is. So really keen in onto those labels. Okay. And next we'll talk. So that's sofas. So really thinking about limiting those sofas. The next thing to really start to limit is I call them, and I learned this from a physician that I studied closely under, but it's great white hazards. And I love the name of it because, you know, when you think of a great white shark, you think, you know, scary, stay away from. So very similar with these types of foods. So the great white hazards are the foods that you eat that instantly convert to sugar in the body. So another thing that kind of falls into that sofas category. Um, but what they do, they quickly raise that blood gl glucose level. So it's something they're called a high glycemic load food. Um, so where, so, you know, if you're a diabetic or a pre-diabetic, you might've heard of the, you know, the GI index or the glycemic index. So thinking about lower glycemic load foods. So stuff that isn't spiking your blood sugar and then dropping because with that drop in blood sugar, you're hungry again. So why you can eat a very empty, high calorie, high sugar, high processed white type fuel and be hungry again in like an hour because the, that appetite command center really stops working properly because the lack of nutrients in it and that rise and spike and drop in blood sugar. So that's where we have the cravings and our food inhibitions go down. Um, so things to be avoiding that fall into these great white hazards and the name really gives it away. It's pretty much anything white. 
white flour products, white rice, white potatoes, sugars, sweets. So the pastas, the white breads, the crackers, the rolls, the pancakes, you know, anything that starts with white, but not to, you know, totally ruin anything delicious for you, but there are whole grain options. You know, there are whole healthy, nutritious options for all of these. So it's not that you never get to eat some sort of starchy food again, but it's just eating the healthier version that is full of fiber, that is full of nutrients, that doesn't have that high glycemic load. Um, because these high glycemic load foods are very easily and quickly broken down by the digestive tract. So they don't keep us full. They don't, you know, they have no satiety. They don't stick with us for a long time. So this is where something to do is make sure that the first ingredient is whole grain. So when you're looking at anything that is of that starchy type nature, whole grain, brown rice, you know, those types of things, whole grain oats, um, that type of products. And then another one to stay away from is booze. And this is a hard one. And alcohol is very tricky calories. So everything we ingest either falls into a carbohydrate, a fat, or a protein, or water. But then alcohol, it doesn't fall into any of those categories. They create it has its own separate category. Um, it has seven calories per gram. And, the, and also, you know, it is a foreign toxic substance to our body. So our body really doesn't have a place to store it because it's detected as toxic and poison to our body. So with that, when alcohol enters into digestion, digestion, it can get split in either to fat and stored or it's an acetate, which is used for energy. So thinking about that though, but your liver, when you do drink, recognizes those byproducts as toxins, like I said. So right away, your body will stop digesting, stop processing any nutrients you have eaten to get that alcohol out. And it typically takes our body about an hour per ounce per one uh, ounce of hard alcohol, beer, or glass, you know, glass of beer, 12 ounces of beer, or six ounces of wine. So thinking about it takes a whole hour for your body to process the, that byproduct. So it puts everything else you've eaten on hold and digestion. So if we've had a few drinks, you know, or, or it's been a six pack of beer, that can take six hours for your body to process. While in the meantime, you've eaten a meal or maybe two meals and all of that is getting pushed back into digestion, back to, we have to get the alcohol out first, get that toxin out, and then it'll start digesting. So it really messes up digestion, really messes up our fuel storage and blood sugar. So, you know, recommended healthy is, you know, for females, one um, drink a day or less. And for males is two drinks a day or less, you know, but with weight loss, this is when I say that if, if you are really serious about wanting to lose weight, sometimes it means cutting out the booze or greatly, greatly reducing. Um, one of the reasons that it sticks to the midsection and that can be the hardest fat to lose it's that adipose fat. So, um, you know, that beer belly, which is that abdominal obesity, which is around all of your important organs. So it's a very type of fat to have. And when you're thinking about calories in a drink, they can range anywhere from hundred calories to 2000 calories for some of those mixed fancy drinks that are loaded then with tons of fat and sugar. So not only are we getting alcohol, now we're getting those sofas along with it. <laughs> and typically when we drink, our food inhibitions go down. We end up snacking on excess calories. We, you know, don't really recognize if we're full or hungry. The cheese plate looks delicious. The pizza's good. And then we have the munchies late at night. So all of those foods that we're now consuming in excess are, are still way pushed out behind that digestion or behind that, you know, uh, processing of the alcohol. So, and poor quality of sleep is a big one with alcohol. So sleep is so important in a health routine and healthy weight loss. And so booze really, there's nothing good for us. You know, I've had a, a doctor that is practices Chinese medicine say, you know, in those, in like the Chinese culture, they only drink to celebrate. So it's very sparingly, it's for events of celebration, but in our, you know, 
Western civilizations, we drink for everything. We drink when we're sad, we drink when we're happy, we drink after work, we drink when we're stressed. So really trying to go back and think about what is the healthy amount for you. And if you're not reaching goals, maybe really reevaluating where you're at with those. Okay, so just kind of a recap on some of the don'ts. Stay, so don't stay on the sofas. So thinking about your sofa, your solid fats and added sugar, try to eliminate those in wherever you can and really pay attention to the labels. So eating too much empty calories, packaged or processed, so lots of sofas in those. So don't skimp on the whole grains. So slowly try to really swap out those great white hazards from your grocery list, from your refrigerator. Start introducing whole grain type stuff. Um, try different types of breads. You know, start making half white flour pasta and half whole grain pasta to slowly introduce your family to it. Um, but if one, if you can change those things, you know, you're still able to eat all those things you love, but you're getting the nutrients that come with it. So don't let your goals be ruined by alcohol and don't beat yourself up. If you have a bad snack, a bad meal or a bad entire day, and it is being resilient and jumping right back on track to your lifestyle, to your healthy lifestyle. All right. So things now to say yes to, and three proven ways to help you eat less. So these are three tricks that I want you to think about on a daily basis. One is to be sure you get a healthy dose of protein at your first meal of the day. So when I say healthy dose, pretty much about 25 grams or more is best. And I say at your first day because this really first meal of the day because this sets you up for success, but really you want to have this dose at every meal, but really starting with that first meal of the day can set you on track for just success and staying full and not having that emotional eating. Um, so things to you know think about that will are high in protein. So eggs, Greek yogurt, nuts and seeds. So this could be you know a nut butter or a seed butter, cottage cheese, lean meats like smoked salmon or protein powder. Um, so there's a little sample bento box breakfast. It looks like it's some eggs or cottage cheese or Greek yogurt, some berries, some almonds with some veggies. So thinking about ways to really um, get in my easy go-tos are a Greek yogurt. And I put a handful of you know nuts in them, um, a protein shake, super easy, scrambled eggs on whole grain toast, you know, so ways to just kind of slowly add them back in, but thinking about your meal, first meal, having protein. Second, engage in time-restricted eating. So tray for short or TRE by limiting your eating to the same eight to 12 hours window each day. So if you're focusing on trying to get all of your meals in in this eight to 12 hours, in a way you are kind of doing non-intentional fasting. You're giving yourself a, your body a time to really digest, to f use you know the fuel that is in stored in your as glycogen throughout your body. So um, sticking to an eight to 12 hour window each day. So whatever time you have your first meal, count out eight hours and make sure you're done eating for the day by that time. And then drinking one pint of water, which can be plain or sparkling before every meal. So just by doing, you know, those three 16 ounces alone, you're going to be getting almost 50 ounces of water in and then trying to add other water in throughout the day. But by drinking the water first, you know, we quench any thirst um, cues that might be hunger cues. It also fills us up. If there's lots of fiber in our stomachs, the water adds binds to the fiber and gives us that full feeling that lasts with us. So water is definitely an extremely important key for healthy weight loss and weight management. So the two secret weapons of appetite control, I've already talked about protein, you know, so here it gives a little bit about the recommended amount. So 10 to 35% of your daily calories. So about eight point or 0 0.82 grams per, to a gram per body weight. So that's kind of a way to, you can easily um, figure that out. And I'm happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one if you want to kind of go and dive into what your macronutrient breakdown should look like. But, you know, trying to make sure there's lean protein in every or most meals or snacks. 
takes a lot longer to digest, which helps our appetite control, muscle control, it boosts our metabolism. And there is a list of some healthy options, seafood, poultry, lean, skinless poultry. So taking that skin off your chicken, wild game, beans, tofu, tempeh, you know, mindful serving of those leaner cuts of red meat, which include pork. So just thinking about what a serving actually looks like. So trying not to opt for the largest ribeye. <laughs> um, and then fiber. Fiber is a very important substance that re also really keeps us full and that most diets are lacking in. So men should aim for about 35 grams and women 25 grams. And if you're tracking your food or logging it in my fitness pal, it's a great way to see what you're getting for fiber on a daily basis. Um, but daily fiber, fiber intake is really that golden ticket to weight management. Helps slow di slow digestion, keeping you fuller longer, bulking effect in that GI tract. I was just talking about the water binds to the fibers, so it bulks, creating that fullness feeling. So skimping on those great white hazards and choose those whole grain options, which are listed there. A few visuals here, and I will send all this out after so you can look back on some calories and how many grams of protein are in these these sources. And, you know, if you are on a plant-based diet, there's excellent ways to be getting your protein from tempeh or tofu or, you know, beans, lentils, seeds, nuts, all of those things. And here are some fiber visuals. So 25 grams of fiber in a day can look like a kiwi, hundred gram of oats, some cooked beans, and a piece of fruit. So some high fiber foods are listed there. Whenever you can opt for that whole option versus, you know, anything that's modified, like packaged. So that's where you'll see things like juice. It's going to have some fiber in it, but nowhere near the same nutrients as actually eating it whole in its wholest form. But frozen veggies or fruit is great as well. So if you're buying in bulk, um, another easy option, canned stuff. And also just be sure to really rinse off any added syrups to it. It's when we're buying like the veggies that have the cream sauces in it, when it really kind of then cancels out any nutrition you're going to be getting then with the added saturated fats. So and healthy fats. So we talked earlier about the two unhealthy fats, but the two healthy fats to really focus on are those poly and monounsaturated fats. They provide energy. They really help absorb a lot of fat soluble and transport some fat soluble vitamins. So our body won't absorb as well a lot of vitamins without having healthy fats in it. Um, so provides essential fatty acids, omega-3s and 6s that cannot be made by our body. So some, you know, nutrients are automatically created, but this, uh, those two essential fatty acids you need to ingest. Um, protects important organs such as our brain, heart, liver from injuries, helps regulate body temperature and different other um, different functions of the body. So you still want to be cautious with fats and eat in moderation because they do have nine calories per gram as opposed to protein and carbohydrates have the four calories per gram. So 20 to 35 percent of our daily calories should be from um, fats alone. And we talked about, you know, around 6% can be unsaturated fats, zero from trans fats. So the rest we want coming from these healthy fats. Okay. So in the mono, mono unsaturated fats, they really do help change your levels of cholesterol, your triglycerides, your LDL levels, which is the bad cholesterol and it ups the good cholesterol. So lots of important um, needs for these types of nutrients. And here's your polys. So the omega-3s, the omega-6s. So I'm not going to go through these each line, but great sources are the salmons, the fatty cups of fish, um, mackerel, walnuts, canola oil, canola oil, soybean oil, and then the sixes are sunflower oil, corn oil, so sorbine oil. So oils that are not solids at room temperature. So that's how you know they're healthy fats. So they never turn into a solid like butter does. So here's those healthy fats. It's a quick cheat sheet for you. And it lists under, you know, which omegas they have, um, which if it's the monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, those types of things. Avocado is a great one. Put some avocado on a salad or on a piece of whole grain toast for a meal. 
put an egg on top to add some protein. So one of my favorites, almonds, is one that I keep all over the house or in my car, in my desk. So when I am noticing hunger cues, I can just pop a few almonds in and they're very filling, you know, easy to store places. Don't go bad too quick. So some fatty tips. So really choosing those lean meats, you know, poultry, wild game, trim visible fat and remove skin off poultry when you can't have those leaner cuts. Cook with less, you know, small amounts of vegetable oil, avocado oil instead of the butters, the lards, the margarines. Switch to low fat or fat free dairy products. Opt for more grilling, broiling, poaching or roasting instead of deep fried foods. Um, you can use applesauce as a substitute in baking for melted butter or oil. It's another way to decrease fats. So healthy fuels. So we talk a lot about that intuitive eating and really focusing on most, you know, most whole foods most of the time. So here are just, you know, really eating a rainbow of foods. So the vegetables, the fruits, the lean proteins, the whole grains, the healthy fats. So I'm not going to go through each of these, but, you know, talks a little bit more, just ideas of what to be making up with your shopping lists. And then some superfoods for appetite control. So foods that have filling um, properties to them, high in fiber, high in healthy, those healthy fats. So lean animal proteins plant proteins, non-starchy veggies, mushrooms, um, non-tropical fruits that don't have too high of sugar um, content, physically intact whole grains. So those are your whole oats, you know, not those um, oats that have been cut down and highly processed. So, you know, thinking about the old fashioned oats, brown black rice, quinoa, farro, those types of things, and then high fiber cereals. So cereal is a great way to get fiber in. Look for cereals that have five grams of fiber per serving and less than 10 grams of sugar. And then also with cereal, just make sure you are measuring out what a serving is. And water, you know, I've touched on how important hydration is earlier, but so many benefits, um, Men should be about getting 15 and a half cups a day or 3.7 liters. Women, almost three liters a day. Um, you'll know you're drinking enough water if you're not feeling thirsty and you'll notice a change in that urine. It's not colorless. It will be colorless. Um, trying to drink water, like I said, a pint before each meal, before and during exercise, if you ever feel thirsty. And then there's an example up there on how you can infuse your waters if you're not one who likes plain water, add some mint or fruit to it, um, sparkling water. They have so many of those out there now that are just, you know, pretty much soda water with um, natural occurring flavors to them. Those are great. Also, I love those. So some of the do's. Plan and prepare. And we'll touch a lot more on some of this planning and prepping with the shopping list and the cooking and meal planning on our next, um, on part two of this webinar. But plan and prepare, have that list, make it priority, cook and eat at home as often as possible. Keep it simple, silly. Really keep meals and snacks simple. Trying to focus on where's my, what's my protein? What's my healthy fat? What's my veggie? You know, so thinking about just making building together an easy, wholesome meal, um, eating regularly and mindfully, pack snacks and meals for work the night before. So you set yourself up for success and then bringing foods and snacks to work, which I have some samples and examples of all of these later on in the presentation that I'll share with you. Um, share meals when you eat out and really, you know, try to eat out as little as possible. We know that eating out absolutely is the worst thing for weight management because the portions are huge. They cook with all the high fats and sugars to make it delicious so that you want to come back and you eat it all. So avoiding eating out as much as you possibly can, because you know what goes into your meals, um, decrease added sugar intake dump out all those sugary beverages, uh, focus on protein and fiber, go nuts. So get the healthy fats in through, you know, a daily serving of nuts. Dark chocolate is an excellent dessert. And then really skipping that diet and thinking moderation about all of these things. Think sustainable, make those small changes and just really believe that you can do this.
So a goal for you today is to set a goal. You know, I know we have our fruits and veggies challenge going on. So hopefully all of you are doing that. Um, we did send out a reminder today with the chart. So if you want to print that out and start today, that'd be a great goal. The goal is to try to eat three veggies a day and two servings of fruit most days of the week. And if you submit that at the end of the month, you can win a gift card. Um, but other than that, you know, think about maybe from now until our next presentation that you set yourself a goal that maybe it's, you're going to eat your, your healthy breakfast with fiber and protein. Maybe it's, you're going to up your water. Um, you're really going to keep an eye on how much sugar or take a sugar break and really take two weeks off from sugar to reset what that sugar level in, uh, does to your brain chemistry. Um, uh, maybe don't drink alcohol during the work week. Um, reduce some great white hazards from your next shopping trip or, you know, take 15 minutes to really eat a meal and enjoy and become more mindful with your eating. Um, here is just a quick visual I like on how 2,200 calories, which can be a healthy range of calories for some people, can easily contain 230 grams of sugar and only 14 grams of fiber, as opposed to the an opposing option of 1800 calories, which only has 40 grams of sugar and a whopping 29 grams of fiber. So moderate swaps is kind of the key of what this looks like. Okay. All right. So any questions, feel free to send them in. I know we're just at the two o'clock hour. If anybody I'm just going to go over a few follow-up points. So the next session of this will be on April 19th, and we'll cover a little bit more into reading a label, meal prepping, you know, how to, what to be keeping in your pantry, looking at your shopping list and really setting yourself up for success. And if you have things you want covered, feel free to email me if you think, want something that you want more information on. Um, the Wonder Health program is very aligned with a lot of the things I like to focus on um, around sustainable lifestyle changes. So we have that currently going on. So if you didn't get signed up this time, we will have it again in August. And then we also have a diabetes prevention program, which is similar to the Wonder Health program, but you are able, if you qualify, um, it's no cost for you and you can participate in things like Weight Watchers or Better Health, which is another online tool um, for no cost. So I will send this link out after, but you can take a little quiz to see if you qualify. And then I'll just quickly go through some of the additional resources that I will send out that is covered in that last, um, the other nutrition presentation on our website that Candace did share earlier this week, but we'll just cover, you know, it goes over the macronutrients, the micronutrients, talks a little bit about that breakdown of calories you should be having per day. Um, and then it gives some healthy ranges on what you should be eating if you are sedentary, if you're active, you know, and this is one that changes day to day during your week. If you are not getting as active as you are on the weekends, you will need less calories, but really the minimum recommendation is about 1100 calories, um, depending on your gender, age, weight, height, activity level, hormone, medication, your goals. If you're looking to lose or gain weight, you know, we adjust these calories in a different direction. And then there is lots of resources and lists on foods to be eating. So breakfast, here are some excellent options on ways to build a healthy breakfast. And then I love the visuals, how to build a healthy toast. You know, like I talked about the avocado toast, there's some other options. You know, one that my son loves is peanut butter with bananas on it, which is super, super easy and quick. <laughs> Um, and breakfast on the go options. So scrambled eggs on whole grain toast, that yogurt with berries and nuts that I talked about. Um, so, but with all of these things, you know, low fat cheese stick, almond, a protein shake and banana. So trying to focus on that fiber and the protein. One of my favorite go-to snacks is apple slices with peanut butter. Super easy and quick. Um, some lunch ideas and you, I, like I said, I'll send these out so you can look at them further later, but just, you know, thinking about when I said, keep it simple, choose your protein, add a fiber and then add a healthy fat. So then here's some examples of those. 
Um, sneak in the veggies and fruit whenever possible. Having snack plates for a lunch is a perfect healthy lunch. Think about as a, like an adult lunchable, but much better. Um, so veggies, fruits, you know, how to sneak them in throughout the day. Always keep them around. When you get home, prep them so they're ready to grab and go. Don't put them in the drawers so that we just throw them away again in two weeks. That used to be the joke of my household is that we would buy a salad, you know, a a bin of salad to just throw away in two weeks. So keep them out, prep them so that they're ready to go so you actually consume them. <laughs> and build your own lunch. So here is some easy lunch combos, which, you know, all are in, a, it looks like an abundance of food, but all are probably under 400 calories, a very healthy, healthy calorie range, but they're extremely nutrient dense. And some dinner ideas. So same as lunch, choose the protein, add the fiber, and then add that healthy fat. And, you know, cooking extra so that you have stuff for leftovers the next day or dinner the next day. So really cooking in bulk can be so easy for setting yourself up for success so you don't feel like you're spending hours in the kitchen. And some dinner builds, which I love. And then snacks. So this can be those ones, you know, in Wonder Health, they call it level two eating, but some things that can kind of hold us over. You know, if we don't eat, if we eat lunch and then we're waiting six, seven hours till dinner time, that's when we can get home. And while we're cooking dinner, we start snacking on chips and salsa. We start snacking because we're almost past that hunger cue of making good choices that now we're just shoving anything in our mouth. Um, so these are where the snacks are so important. So keeping things that have fiber and protein, you know, raw veggies, nuts, fruit, healthy crackers, triscuits is one that I love. Triscuits and peanut butter or triscuits and cottage cheese can be the easiest, you know, pull out four crackers, few scoops of cottage cheese that will hold you over for at least an hour or two. Um, so healthy chips, you know, it's a healthy whole grain type chips that stuff that has actually fiber in it. So it's going to stick with you. Um, yogurt, a great one. I'm a big fan of the Greek yogurt because it has all those healthy bacteria in it um, for the gut health and usually much lower sugar. So looking at sugar on yogurt is a very important one. And we'll touch on that um, when we talk about labels. Um, cheese stick is great. Homemade smoothies, you know, granola bars. There are healthy, easy granola bars up there. Ones that you can actually seed and tack to nuts and seeds in them. Hard boiled eggs is a great one. And then dark chocolate is an excellent treat for dessert or snack. And then healthy fueling on the go. So just some quick tips for, you know, in the car, at, in your desk, at work, bring it for the week, those types of things. So it is so much about the planning and the prepping and the really setting yourself up for success. And it does, like I said earlier, the practice makes progress. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. And you learn the tips and tricks that work for you. You learn the timing of when you need to do it. You learn, you know, okay, I'm not going to be successful this week if I don't do it. And then as you start seeing the results and the results can be weight loss, but they also can be just feeling better, better, clear energy, better sleep, not having those highs and lows, of the sugar and blood sugar drops. So as you really continue on this journey, you will reap the benefits. It might not be the weight loss right away, but stick with it. That the more you stick with it, the better you will feel the confidence build and it all, it will work out for you. So the nutrition is a harder one, but we're here to help. We have lots of programs. We want you to have the resources you need. So feel free to reach out, please. If you are wanting more help, um, I will put my slide back up. You're welcome to call me, text me, send me an email. Um, I would love to work with you and just dive further into your nutrition. So thank you so much for joining me today. We will email out a recording and the PDFs. Um, I'll send the link to the other one, but this will also be on our website. So um, thank you. And I hope you enjoyed the webinar today. And I look forward to seeing you next month, April 19th for part two. All right. Any questions or comments?
I don't see anything coming in now, but like I said, send me an email if you think of anything. Lots was covered today. I know it's a lot, so it can get confusing, but all right. Thanks for joining and we'll see you soon.